Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Artilist webinar series. My name is Sharice Ruan, Marketing Director at Artilist. Thank you for joining us for five steps to building an effective CMMC strategy. Today, we're joined by Artilist President Michael Specka and Account Executives Bethany Estes and Carly Brown to break down the five areas you should be considering when building an effective strategy for getting and staying CMMC compliant. We'd like for today's webinar to be more of a discussion, so please ask questions as you, excuse me, as you think of them, and we will incorporate them into the presentation. Please note if we do not get to your question during today's session, an Artilist representative will reach out to answer your question directly. The webinar is being recorded and will be shared with you after today's session. As always, if you have, if you have any questions after today's webinar, please email marketing at artilist.com. Now I'd like to turn it over to Michael, Carly, and Bethany. Yeah, so um, I'm just kind of going to give a little bit of a better idea of who Artlist is um, and some background on us. So we are a CMMC RPO, so that stands for Registered Provider Organization. We tailor to cyber defense and digital transformation, and we build out cyber programs through a managed service. So we are a Microsoft Gold partner supporting the GCC High platform. And we serve customers as large as the DOD, all the way to small defense contractors under 10 people. And our goal is to ensure that every organization has access to cybersecurity capabilities that they need. Um, and a few little fun, fun facts I always like to point out is that we've been doing this before CMMC existed. Uh, we've been around since 2013, which I think is really cool because we know the space really well. Uh, we're also one of 12 partners included in the Microsoft Inner Circle, and we are on track to become a C3PAO so that we know what the DOD is looking for in companies to get compliant. But also on the flip side, we are DOD contractors ourselves, so we understand what each company in the DIB is looking through, looking to do to get compliant. Um, but now I'm just going to pass it over to Bethany to talk a little bit about how to build your approach to cybersecurity. Thanks, Carly. Um, hey, everybody. Thanks for hopping on today. My name is Bethany. And so today we're going to go over um, building your approach to cybersecurity. Um, we've developed a five step approach on how to um, plan out uh, your um, program. And so we're going to break it down and make it easier to understand how to get compliant. Um, the biggest thing here is we really want to keep it conversational today, so please feel free to uh, ask any questions in the chat, um, and we'll try our best to get to everybody. Um, so yeah, I'm going to keep moving on and um, go through these five steps. So what CMMC level do you want to achieve? Um, this is going to be our first step and trying to identify what level we want to achieve. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Michael. Michael, can you describe, um, you know, a little bit more about these three levels on that 2.0 model for us? Sure, absolutely. So um, for those of you who were tracking the 1.0 model, you know, one of the biggest changes from 1.0 to 2.0 was that we went from five levels to three levels, um, which does make life a little bit easier in terms of making a determination about where you need to get to. So level one uh, has 17 practices in it, as it says on the slide. Um, but I think you know probably the biggest thing to keep in mind about level one is that those 17 practices actually align with uh, FAR 52-204-21, um, which means that every government contractor, not just defense contractors, should be practicing level one. <laughs> level one does uh, allow for an annual self-assessment to determine your compliance, and there's an assessment guide available uh, from uh, uh, from DOD, uh, from the Office of the Secretary of Defense to uh, perform that self-assessment. Level two, um, you know, the former level three, the biggest change there is that the, they've got 110 practices now that are completely aligned with NIST, uh, NIST Special Publication 800-171. So uh, level two is uh, necessary for uh, protecting um, uh, 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 controlled unclassified information, CUI. So if that's a term you've heard, that's what that means. And uh, most contractors that are, you know, really going to be concerned about CMMC tend to be looking uh, to get to level two. Most of our customers are looking to get to level two, uh, although we do have uh, some level one uh, customers as well. Um, you know, notably, level two has two different assessment 
uh, standards. Uh, some of these are going to be done. Um, you know, some some organizations are going to be allowed to do annuals, uh, but third party assessments um, uh, run by C3 PAOs or conducted by C3 PAOs that are overseen by the Cyber AB, the former CMMC AB, is what you're getting at level two. Level three, uh, 110, more than 110 uh, uh, practices. This is based on NIST SP 80172. So this is going to be everything in level two plus level three. Um, while the DOD hasn't really defined level three, uh, you can infer a couple things about level three by looking at the old level five. And, um, you know, essentially this is going to be for uh, specified CUI. So particular types of CUI or particular programs that are uh, that are sensitive, um, you know, beyond sort of the standard CUI program. So level one, contracting information, you're protecting federal contracting information, FCI. Level two is CUI, level three, CUI specified. Okay, so um, very interesting. Can you kind of dive into the difference in the assessment requirements for each level? I know you kind of touched on it, but um, just a little bit more of an explanation on that. Yeah, absolutely, um, because the, the DOD has published some draft guidance around assessments um, and uh, two assessment guides, a level one assessment guide and a level two assessment guide. And we'll be talking a little bit more about assessment scope um, uh, later on in the discussion. <clears throat> the level two assessment uh, for some uh, is going to be allowed to be an annual self-assessment, but for most, you're going to need to be assessed by a, a certified um, assessment organization. Those assessment organizations are certified by the Cyber AB. So if you're looking for one, the Cyber AB is a good place to go. Um, the firm that performs your assessment uh, should not be or cannot be the form that provides you services for um, being compliant. Uh, so if you're looking for support, uh, you're going to want to find two organizations, one that's going to assess you and one that's going to help you um, get and stay compliant. That's really the, the biggest difference there. This is not to be confused with the SPRS score. This is something you should have done, you should be doing now, um, which is that there's a self-assessment guide and you can follow the self-assessment guide to give yourself a score against your current 800-171 requirements that are mandated by DFARS uh, 7012. Um, so you know, make sure that you're, you're doing your SPRS score, your SPUR score, uh, a lot of people call it. If, if you haven't done that already. Well, that's really helpful. Um, I know personally when I'm talking to people and um, just getting to know more about their environments, they're indicating there's a couple different factors as to why they're even looking at CMMC, right? So they've got primes that are pressing on them. They've got, um, they've got uh, maybe specific requirements they know are coming. Um, in the immediate future, um, people are asking them for their score and things like that. Um, but the biggest thing that I feel like a lot of people are talking about too is like, how do I pick where I want to go? Um, you know, what level am I going to end up at? Sure. No, that that's, um, it's interesting uh, to sort of where the motivation is coming from. Um, I know uh, early on when we started uh, helping organizations get uh, ready for CMMC under the old model, um, the ones that were diving in were really looking at it as, well, you know, we're going to get ahead of this and it's going to give us an advantage. Um, but to hear from you that, you know, prime contractor pressure or even, you know, th this um, March deadline that, that uh, DOD has advertised is when they're going to start putting CMMC in the contracts comes up. I mean, as far as where you want to get long term, um, if you already have DFAR 7012 requirements in your contracts, you will probably, I will say, you know, very likely need to be uh, level two compliant. While there's, you know, certainly for the folks who really like digging into the, you know, <clears throat> really get fascinated with sort of the policy nuances. You know, maybe there are some arguments that you could make that you're not going to need to be level two, even if you have 7012, because 7012 is in almost every contract, and you're not going to be uh, creating or handling CUI. And if you're not going to be creating or handling CUI, then you know you don't need to be level two compliant. So, 
if it's sitting in your contracts, if Sony 12 is sitting in your contracts, but it doesn't, you know, you don't, you don't get any any documents with markings on them, and that COI standard is relatively new, so don't just judge it on that. Look for FOUO markings or limited dissemination markings as well that you know will become COI markings in the future. <laughs> um, you know, if the only reason you need you know you have 712 in, in your contracts is because it's just sort of been thrown in there, uh, then it's possible that you wouldn't need to be level two. You could just be level one. But if you're receiving documents from the government, if you're creating documents, uh, there's a, a, an excellent chance that you're going to need to be level two. Um, level three, I, I'd say, you know, you'll know, right? Um, if you're not sure that you need to be level three uh, compliant or you don't think you need to be level three compliant, you're probably right. Um, you know, if you're handling certain types of CUI specified like nuclear, um, then there's a good chance you will need to be level three compliant. Um, and then, you know, just as a word of caution, as you're thinking about this, you know, when we say long term, you know, we're talking about in the next year or two, I would expect, I mean, we certainly expect in, in terms of how we're handling this internally for our defense contracting business, that, you know, what today is, is you know, a level two requirement as adversaries get uh, better and as the DOD gets more concerned about supply chain, you know, you could expect to see level three become the new standard, but, you know, that that's years away. That's really yeah. interesting. Um, Sorry, Bethany, I just cut you off. No, really quick, because um, I have a question kind of going off of uh, these levels too, and we can kind of touch more into this um, when we get into the shared responsibility matrix portion of it. But I'm kind of looking at these levels here and I'm thinking as a, as a business, uh, I'm wondering, do I have to be level two for my whole business or can I be level two for like half the business, level one for the other half? Like, are there any indicators um, that we might be able to point out for people to help them decide if it's going to be like a, an all-in-one or if we're going to be able to mix it up a little bit. Yeah, well, late, later on uh, in your in your approach, um, uh, in the, the methodology that we've developed here for building your approach, we talk about scope and making scoping decisions. Um, so I think at this stage of the game, the question is really just what's the level, the highest level you need to get to for at least some part of your organization. But that question about, you know, uh, is it, is it everybody or is it just some people is an interesting question and it, it depends a lot on how you run your business. Is that, um, you know, Bethany, when you're out talking to uh, co uh, customers and just out in the market generally, is that a frequent concern? You know, people saying, well, you know, I, I'm a government contractor, but I think I only need a couple of people or this por portion of my business to to be level two compliant and everybody else can can just be level one. Is that something you hear a lot? Yeah, definitely. And also, um, I think the phrase I hear a lot is I'm just a small business. I like I don't need to I don't need all of this, you know. And so um, there's definitely a line that we're trying to find between um, does everybody you know need all of these criteria or um, can we limit a, limit it a little bit? Um, I'm, I take the approach to personally, just for cybersecurity wise, that you want to protect your own business. So you, you want these practices and requirements in place. Um, but uh, th that is something that people are concerned about is they, they feel kind of small um, and they, they don't feel like they sh should be required, I guess, to, to have to meet um, the stringent requirements that have been put in place. Um, so it's definitely a concern. Well, I think uh, if if we hop back a slide um, to uh, to the overall approach, you know, the, the, that particular question is a is step three in the process here. So mm -hmm. once you've identified your long term goal, um, then we can think about you know how fast do we want to go. After we think about how fast we want to go, that then we can identify uh, you know what what are the systems, what are the identities, right? What parts of the business need, what kinds of protection, and then how are you gonna do that? Uh, and of course the hows in step four and five. Um, so it might be worth moving on here if there's no um, audience questions to um, talking about options for taking steps. Because I think when people uh, are thinking about how far they need to go or, or the level they need to get to, there's a, um, you know, a concern of, well, I don't, you know, I don't know that I'm going to need all of this, so I'm not going to do anything, 
And, you know, I, there's there's other choices there, right? There's other options in, uh, than doing everything uh, or doing, doing nothing at all. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we, we noticed, you know, back in, in the level one days, and I think this is still really prevalent in the market, is that there's a lot of folks um, out there looking for uh, and selling pre-assessments. And we, we did our, uh, you know, our share of pre-assessments early on in, in the CMMC uh, journey, uh, but we've stopped doing them. And the reason why we stopped doing them is that we primarily are serving smaller businesses uh, with our, uh, our amount of service offering. And, you know, those businesses have a limited budget. And, and really behind the question of how far I should go, you know, part of that comes down to cost. If it was the same cost for you to be level two as level one, you would just choose to be level two because then you wouldn't have to worry about it. Uh, but, uh, you know, obviously that's not the case. And so these businesses, they've got limited funds and uh, then they go spend, you know, two, five, you know, sometimes $10,000 or more on an assessment, a uh, pre-assessment. And what that pre-assessment tells them is what they already know. Um, that their systems aren't ready and their, uh, you know, their business processes aren't ready. And probably those systems and those business processes are so far away from ready that it's not particularly cost effective to change them. You're just going to replace most things, whether you move to the cloud or, or put new stuff in place. Um, you know, there's a really good chance you're going to be uh, starting over in, in terms of systems and now you've just spent ten thousand dollars for someone to tell you that uh, so that money uh, that could be applied to getting your uh, you know getting yourself compliant is has been spent um so you know that's you know from my perspective that's something i'd love to hear from you all is you know you're, you're out there talking to people a whole lot more than i am now how much are the the is the question of just just getting an SSP or just getting a poem or just doing a pre-assessment coming up versus uh, people out there who are really looking for help getting compliant? You know, for me personally, I've been talking to a lot of companies and I rarely hear them say that they just want an SSP or a poem. A lot of people actually want to know how they can get compliant and kind of where to start. And um, just something that I was going to touch on the, on the last slide, but I can also bring it up in this slide is just with becoming CMMC compliant, not everyone knows if they need compliance right away. But uh, I've seen a lot of companies wanting to get compliant for a competitive advantage. Um, so I have kind of seen a shift from people wanting just an SSP or a POEM to actually wanting to go level one and then all the way to level two. Okay. Okay, no, I I think that's a good sign. I think that's a good sign that that you know the people out there are getting more educated on what CMMC is and what their options are. Um, I know we've developed a solution um, that allows you to you know get started uh, without having to commit all the way to let going to level two and the full budget for level two. Um, so Carly, can you just talk a little bit about what that set of recommendations is? Are yeah, yeah. So kind of when I talk to a company. If someone isn't really sure, you know, do I need to go level two? I always say that you can always just go level one. Um, it's a way to kind of dip your toes in the water. And then if you need to get CMMC level two, that way you already have an SSP and a poem in place. So it's always kind of a good idea to start somewhere, you know, and then in the future, if you want to build off of that, at least you have that foundation. Um, so you should at least kind of get the requirements that the government's already asking for. Um, but I also kind of want to shift gears a little bit. And I have a question that I know kind of comes up a lot is if a company is ITAR compliant, do they also need to be CMMC compliant? Yeah, that, that's, that's an interesting point um, in, in this decision. So, you know, and I think we're showing this on the slide here that, um, you know, you could be level one, you could go for level two, and then there's this interim step where you need an SSP, you need a POAM, you need a score uh, in SPURS. And so um, doing the level one and then adding a couple things on uh, to prepare for level two is a useful step. But then there's also this question of um, reciprocity. And there isn't, I mean, there's, 
there's a lot of talk from DOD that they're looking for ways to create reciprocity. There's other standards out there. Um, some organizations might have gone through FedRAMP uh, for some of their systems, for example. Um, and so it's it, it's not really clear exactly how the government intends to let reciprocity work. Uh, I think ITAR in particular comes up a lot, and and the you know probably the most important thing to remember is that while both CUI right CMMC requirements um, are out there for cybersecurity and ITAR requirements are out there for cybersecurity, they're not exactly the same requirements, and and ITAR is not technically CUI. Um, if you're getting, you know, it's possible that you're getting data from the government and that data is ITAR data and that ITAR data, um, then the government is going to consider CUI, right? But it can't be CUI if the government doesn't own the data or didn't create the data. Um, you know, that's, so let me just take a pause there for a second. I'm not a contract attorney and that's a broad generalization. I'm sure you know, you can find uh, some some problems with my general definition, but the the overall point is just because you see that it's ITAR doesn't 100% always mean that it's CUI, especially if it's your organization that generated it, right? Because then it's not the government's data. So, in in many many cases, if you are receiving government data, um, you know, there's an excellent chance that that ITAR data is CUI and you're going to need to protect it as CUI. Um, and just because you've put all your CMMC compliance policies in place doesn't mean that you've done absolutely everything that you need to do in order to be able to protect ITAR. Um, probably the biggest overlap, you know, of the two sets of requirements is um, protecting the data from, um, at least with certain kinds of CUI, protecting the data from foreign eyes and so using systems especially cloud systems that are not accessible outside of the u.s is an important part of the uh, important part of the equation okay. um, i'm going to interrupt really quick we have a couple questions in the chat um i'll go ahead and read the first one um so how much time does achieving cmc level one and creating an ssp and polyam for level two buy me when ultimately i need to be level two um, so I'll go ahead and answer that. That's a good question. So you're supposed to have a score and an SSP in Poem right now. Um, those are the two requirements that are, are in effect as of right now. So what doing level one and SSP in Poem does is it gets you that score faster. And then if you don't, um, like you don't have to make the full commitment, um, at least Artilis with us, if you contract with uh, us, we, you'll already have a relationship with a provider in place. You'll have a plan um, and then you'll have a way to start scheduling um, and making sure that you're addressing what controls actually do need to happen and what you do need to do next. And you also start performing some of, some of the most essential controls. Um, so you're going to want to start putting your level one controls in place at least so you're getting started. Um, and I can't stress that enough. It's just like making sure you're getting started and um, preparing yourself for what's coming. Oops, sorry. Didn't mean to do that. Um, so yeah, it, uh, and then we have a second question um, or a couple other questions that I'll go ahead and read. Um, several times you have mentioned SSP and a uh, second item. I know SSP stands for System Security Plan, but I don't understand the second item. Oh, POAM, okay. Plan of Action and Milestones is what that stands for. Um, would you please spell out what you are referring to? Yeah, Plan of Action and Milestones. Um, Michael, do you want to go into the two policy pieces really quickly? So yeah, can... yeah, absolutely. We'll also stop for just a second to talk about the SPUR score um, um, as well. So your system security plan describes everything that you're going to do to protect your data. Um, well, and, and really to protect the government's data. Uh, the plan of action and milestones is the, the delta, right? The gap between what you know you need to have in place to be compliant with all of 800 uh, and B4-7012, and then where you actually are. So um, the, and, and you'll hear this as a verb sometimes, people will talk about whether or not a control is poamable, uh, meaning I have to have it now versus it's okay for it to be on my, my plan. And, you know, the whole movement behind CMMC just to, to talk about policy for a second, um, really originated because DFARS 7012 required all this stuff to happen, you know, back in 2017. Um, 
but items that you hadn't completed could go on your on your poem on your plan and then you know what in reality wound up happening is the thing stayed on their plan forever and so you know one of the impetuses behind cmmc is um to create an accountability mechanism so that you can't leave things on your poem forever um, but when you sit down to um, be compliant today 800-171 calls for you to have this SSP and it calls for you to have a, a POAM. And uh, this relates to your SPRS score, your SPUR score, which you have to have done today too. Your SPRS score, um, you know, you lose points essentially for not doing certain controls. But if you don't have an SSP and a POAM, then you have to report to, to SPURS that you are fully out of compliance. Doesn't matter how many things you've done or haven't done. If you don't have the SSP in the POAM, then you're not compliant. That's an absolute requirement uh, going back to 7012. So um, that's why we, we uh, recommend to organizations that are trying to sort this out. Look, if you don't have the budget or now's a bad time to inject the change in your organization, uh, or you know, you know next year you're going to be investing in a different IT infrastructure or whatever, today's not the right day to go about contracting to get to level two or hiring personnel to get you to level two or whatever, uh, you know, however you choose to resource it. If you implement level one, then you're meeting the FAR. And if you go ahead and get that SSP and POAM done, then you can have a SPUR score. And those are things that, again, the DOD and prime contractors are looking for today. So hopefully that answers the question about uh, a POAM. Car Carly, Bethany, anything we should add? On poems. Um, no, I think that was pretty thorough. Um, I think it would be good now to kind of start moving on to the systems um, and everything that's in scope and go into a little bit more detail about what people should consider. Um, so when we're considering the in scope things, um, what, Michael, do you feel like are going to be the biggest things that people need to consider uh, being in scope for CMMC? Sure. Um, yeah, let's, let's drill into this for a second. So up on the uh, up on the slide, there's a page from the CMMC Assessment Scope Level 2 uh, guide. So, uh, and the link's right there, um, acqosd.mil slash CMMC is where you can find the official documentation uh, on CMMC. Um, I would say, you know, if you don't have that link, you know, throw it in your favorites now or take a picture of the slide because um, I know when I... Uh, just you know, go go to Bing or Google and search for CMMC. I get two pages of vendors, and it, it you know it takes a little while to click around and get yourself to the official docs. But if you want you know from the horse's mouth, so to speak, what OSD is saying about CMMC, yeah, this is the, the 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 place to go. So you can download the scoping guide, and uh, uh, they provide this table of what is and isn't in scope. What isn't, you know, 100% apparent in here is then the decisions that you might make about what this means for your your enclaves, for the, the how you draw the lines around your systems. So we'll talk about that for, you know, just a minute. Um, the obvious items here is that anything that's, you know, this is the top top row, anything that processes, stores, or transmits CUI, or that provides security protection for those systems needs to be assessed against CMMC practices. So if you're gonna be processing, storing, or transmitting CUI, you wanna um, you know, sort of go all the way with your level two assessment. Uh, so you need an SSP, you need an asset inventory, you need a network diagram, and then you know the remainder of those controls, 110 controls, you have to have in place. Um, what people frequently, um, at least in my experience, what people frequently misunderstand is the next two items that are in the assessment scope. So you'll notice this bottom out of scope assets are assets that can't process store or transmit CUS, CUI at all. And you got to separate those. Um, but this stuff in the middle, contractor risk managed assets and specialized assets are an interesting category. Um, so this is going to be things like labs, you know, operational technology, you know, so manufacturers, uh, you know, have to deal with this. Um, test equipment, equipment that may or may not process CUI. And notice the government property is in here too. So government property that's in your possession. Um, 
uh, all of these assets, these specialized assets, and then and then any risk managed asset that is, you know, not necessarily separated from your CUI assets, um, does need to be managed, and it is within the assessment. The difference here is that NIST 800-171, and this is a little bit of a nuance. Um, so if you have questions about the details, please, please feel free to throw them in the chat. But um, NIST 800-171 is a guide to protecting government data. And a lot of people have adopted that standard as a way to protect their data or any kind of data. Um, but there's some stuff in, in uh, 800-171 that you might not choose to do for your data or for assets that you manage the risk of. But if you notice from looking at this table, they're not completely out of scope. The assessor is required to review your SSP and make sure that those assets are appropriately documented and that you have some set of security policies, procedures, and practices in place to um, decrease risk to those assets. So what this doesn't mean is, oh, here's my CUI uh, network or my CUI cloud, and I connect to it from you know, all kinds of things, but those things don't, uh, don't process the information, right? It's all in the cloud. Um, that doesn't mean that the assessor isn't going to care how you're making that connection. Um, the, the the systems that you have to manage the risk, you've got to at least have a good answer for. And so if you read these details on the right here, you know they're going to take a look. If it doesn't look very good, uh, they're going to note that, and there's going to be an impact to that. They're, they're not going to go deep dive in that assessment, but but it does matter. And then your specialized assets, same way. We're not going to assess them against other CMMC practices. We are going to make sure that they're in the inventory, that they're documented in the SSP, that we have some sort of set of security policies and procedures and practices that are being applied to them. I would recommend at a minimum, do level one, right? If you're going to have federal contracting information on any of those systems, make sure they're at level one. Another thing that's worth noting here, we can talk about this a little bit more when we're talking about technology. But you had asked me earlier, Bethany, about level three. You're required in level three, at least you were under the old level five, to keep your CUI network and your non-CUI network separate. Um, and so when you're thinking about scope, you know, that's probably one thing to consider is you know, make sure those are two separate things if, if you have a goal eventually of being level three. That was my goal. Sorry. 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 Hold on to that thought, Carly. I have a question in the chat really quick. Um, what versions of Microsoft 365 are compliant with CMMC 2.0? Ah, oh, that's a great question. Um, so Microsoft will, um, if you go to, Microsoft's got a great uh, blog post written by um, a guy named Richard Wakeman um, about what CMMC, or sorry, what clouds Microsoft runs that are CMMC compliant. And they will only uh, sign up for their uh, government commercial cloud high. Uh, and the reason why is that there are certain types, and he goes into this in a whole lot more detail, and I might misquote him a little bit here, so I'd, I'd recommend going to the source. But um, The, the main reason is, is that there are certain types, there are plenty of types of CUI that um, can't have any foreign access at all. And, uh, you know, ITAR is an obvious uh, case if the ITAR is being produced by the government. Um, and GCC High, Government Commercial Cloud High, is the only cloud that Microsoft will guarantee doesn't uh, allow foreign access at all. Um, some of the other ones might have foreign resources in the support chain, um, and so GCC High, even though even though all the data's uh, you know within the you know U.S. boundary, right? It's it's in CONUS um, data centers, but the the su support personnel might not be U.S. citizens, and so uh, GCC High is the only uh, the only one that you should be using for for um, 
you know, for any sort of a CMMC enclave, uh, at least level two enclave, I should say. Uh, again, and we can probably um, get that that out the link to to uh, Richard's blog. Uh, it goes goes in great detail as to why that is. There's also um, some DFARS requirements in 7012 about uh, you know like how long you hold on the data and the government's right to inspect and some other stuff. And GCC High is the only environment that Microsoft will um, let you flow 7012 down to them. So uh, you know that's a step that a lot of people uh, uh, don't necessarily think about is making sure that their 7012 requirements are flowed down to their their contractors, and um, Microsoft won't do that in their commercial environment. Uh, Bethany, you think that uh, covered it? Yeah, and um, I was just gonna hop in and say the question that I had earlier. Uh, when you were talking about just the systems that need to be protected. Um, I know like a real life example that I have from companies that I'm talking to is they will ask me, you know, does everyone need to be on the same enclave if only 10% of my employees are handling CUI? Um, and I kind of wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, no, that's a great, that's a great question. That's something that comes up a lot for organizations. Uh, even if they're not trying to get to level three, they say, well, you know, why do I need to move everyone onto this uh, system that, you know, is potentially more expensive? And what I encourage people to think about when they're trying to make that decision is collaboration between different uh, members of the workforce. Um, and for anybody out there who does industrial security, right, classified work, um, you know, has and has been in those environments, you've lived this where you have two totally separate systems and now I need to collaborate with different people. But, you know, to think about it from a technical perspective, I now have two digital identities. I've got my login to my FCI environment. I got my login to my control CUI environment. Now, which calendar has the right appointments, right, on it? Um, so now you're forwarding you know, you're meeting requests from one environment to the other, but, you know, hopefully from the low side to the high side, hopefully from the FCI environment to the controlled environment. So your controlled environment calendar is the latest one. Someone wants to find you on, on chat, you know, maybe you're you're sitting on the wrong machine to get or in the wrong um, environment to get the, the, you know, the ping. So you're harder to reach. So in a, if these 10% of your workforce routinely interacts with the remainder of the workforce, um, Unless you're really, really small, it is probably more cost effective to maintain a separate controlled enclave for those 10 people to work in when they have to work on CUI. Because they're going to need to collaborate with those 90%. You know, that let's just say you got 100 employees, you're 90 other employees all the time. And so you're going to want those people to have an identity in that system and just, you know, note to themselves when they've got to hop over to the, you know, the other system and work on it. Some organizations, those 10 people um, don't really collaborate with the other 90 at all. All right. So even though it's 10%, um, you know, it's, it's probably easier to just have them only be in the controlled enclave mm -hmm. uh, because then, you know, their identity is rooted in the work that they're doing all the time, which is the controlled work. And they don't really need to collaborate with the people who aren't doing the controlled work. So it's, it's easier to have 90 in one and 10 in the other than 100 in one and then 10 having a second one. Where it, where it starts to get messy and it's worth, you know, running numbers, uh, and I've seen a number of different solutions for this, is when, um, you know, you've got 100 people and, you know, 45 of them do controlled work a lot. So, you know, now does it make sense for them to all be in the controlled environment? Because even though those other 55 don't do controlled work, um, they might, and you don't want it to be a big interruption if they do. Um, and it's easier for them to all be able to collaborate all the time uh, because those 45 do, once you look at the price of having, you know, 100% of your company in your FCI environment and 45% of your company being in a second environment, it actually winds up being more expensive because of the double environments for 45 people. Uh, so that's where you're going to want to run the numbers. 
and you might decide just to put everybody in the CUI environment um, out of the gate. And obviously, if the majority of your employees are handling CUI, then just getting everybody in the CUI environment and using some, you know, uh, role-based authentication inside the environment to keep the people who can't access CUI away from it uh, is is going to be the easiest setup. But it's a, it's a great question, and you yeah. really need to think about how your people work. I was just going to jump in and say we do have a question from the chat that I wanted to read off. Um, is that equivalent to E1 through E3? Oh, okay, right. So, um, so E1 through E3 uh, or E5 or E3 with um, the E5 security add-on, these are all different um, licenses inside the GCC high environment. You might hear them referred to as G1, um, just indicating that it's GCC high, but uh, that's a little bit more informal of a term. Um, your, like your quote will say e, E3 or E5 in most cases. So those different levels, um, it, so I hate to give you this answer, but it depends. We, for our services, use E5. And the reason why we use E5 is because that's gonna give us and you the broadest amount of capability from Microsoft um, and, and therefore the lowest services burden um, whether you're do, performing those services with your personnel or you've got a contractor performing those services, um, you know, it's just easier to do the things that you need to do with, um, you know, inside GCC High if you're on E5. Uh, is it possible to be, you know, compliant using only the, the level three with some add-ons? Um, you know, technically you could achieve it, but you're going to have some tools that aren't at your disposal, right? That you would have if you bought E3 with the add-ons. Um, now, if you're not going to be 100% in the Microsoft environment, um, right? If you're going to, you know, or if you already own additional products from other providers that that meet some of the controls, then you can, you know, put put something together that that gets you where you need to go. Um, for our managed services, they're on E5. Um, I also see that there's one more question here that's related about GCC High being a guarantee for CMMC compliance. And this is a great question for, for two reasons. Um, the first one is, uh, I mean, just the simple answer is no. Um, but that's true of any technology, right? So um, as people get more familiar with NIST 800-171, uh, you got to realize that inside this inside this set of compliance requirements, there's um, some things that you can just set up, uh, but there's things that you have to do and you have to do on a regular basis. And that goes beyond configuring the system, like monitoring, right? So you have to look for adversary activity. You have to collect logs. You have to analyze them. Um, you have to maintain uh, some procedures that help you control, you know, data and how data flows. And so those are things that happen, you know, daily, weekly, monthly, um, you know, some activities we recommend you do every six months or once a year. And so absolutely you need a system and then you also need to make sure that you've configured the system correctly. Um, and then you have to make sure that your procedures and processes both inside the technology and out uh, are conducted in such a way to meet the requirement. So it isn't just a purchase, right? And uh, that's why our services are managed services because you got to do, you know, you got to do the right thing uh, all the time, right? It's not a, a set and forget uh, kind of thing. And let, let me add here, um, just because I see we're getting tight on time, that when you go to get assessed, you need to be able to produce evidence for the uh, for the assessor that you are doing the right things. So you know, we, we can talk about this a little bit more if we got time when we get to step five here about getting your resources. Um, but in addition to making sure that any third party uh, you hire or any you know personnel that you hire understand the controls and know how to set things up, make sure that they know how to write your policies and gather your evidence in line with how that assessment's going to be conducted. 
So our policies and procedures uh, map directly to assessment objectives inside NIST 800-171. So every control has, you know, somewhere between two and six uh, objectives that you have to meet. There might be one or two with only one, but for the most part, it's between two and six assessment objectives that you have to meet. And we've written all of our stuff to line up directly with those assessment objectives. And we've cataloged what evidence you're gonna collect or we're gonna collect for you to demonstrate that you're doing those assessment objectives. So when the assessors come and they gotta figure out how much it's gonna to cost to assess you, you can say, well, look, all of our stuff lines up exactly with what you need to see. And so you wanna figure out what's going on with this control and this assessment objective. Here's our procedure that maps exactly to that thing. And here's the evidence that demonstrates that we're doing it. So you're not gonna to need to spend a lot of time asking us for details, you're gonna be able to find it you know, quickly. And we've talked to uh, C3 PAOs who have confirmed that, that you know, that's gonna mean that their assessment is, is much more affordable. So I'm gonna to move to the next slide here because I think a lot of what we're talking about actually goes um, really well with this, the technology that, we, that you should adopt. Um, and so there's actually a question in the chat that kind of leads into this. Um, so are you implying that you cannot use a CMMC compliance system and communicate from it with other people in non-CMMC compliance systems? Does that include not being able to use your GCC high email to communicate with people who are not in GCC high? Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. If I gave that impression, that's, um, that's not what I was referring to. Um, I'm, I'm simply talking about um, some of the, um, you know, some of the more identity-based collaboration tools, for example, shared calendars, right? Um, you know, that's something that people use a lot. And I, if I'm, if I'm in my FCI environment and I have my identity, you know, I'm mspeca at artalist.com and com is my FCI environment. And I've got a calendar there, right? So I get meeting requests and I send meeting requests. And then people in the organization can see when I'm free and when I'm busy. That information, you know, is not necessarily available in, in, to my my CUI identity that sits in GCC High. So yeah, absolutely, you can email back and forth. You know, if you're sending CUI, you got to make sure you're encrypting it and you're only sending it to another CUI system. Um, so you know, you don't want to communicate willy nilly. You need to be cognizant of the fact that if you're communicating about C CUI, that you communicate about that with, um, you know, uh, um, you know, with uh, the recipient being prepared to receive that information. Um, just talking about things like calendars, like chat, um, at least as of today, you in the Microsoft environment, you can't chat from a CUI enclave to a non-CUI enclave. Now, Microsoft's made some announcements that they're working on increasing the ability of these tools to collaborate cross system. Uh, so hopefully that's a burden that will go away uh, over time. So it's not quite as, it's not quite as strict a setup as if you're, you know, if you're in a environment where you have a secret network and a, and a non-class network, um, but you do have two logins and having two logins in two different systems is a pain. That That's all I meant by that statement. Yeah. Um, okay. Great. Sorry, Carly. Um, I'm going to go ahead and shift gears here really quick, though, because I want to know a little bit more about um, like the actual cloud. And at least personally, like Carly and I, when we're talking to people, we get a lot of um, a lot of a little bit or not a lot, but a little bit of pushback on the uh, idea of going to the cloud if you're already um, very much so on premises. Can you kind of explain a little bit about um, the benefits of moving to the cloud uh, and what that would look like? Sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, I've been I've been doing this for a long time now. Uh, it probably closing in on thirty years of you know various uh, I, IT positions, and so you know, built a, a number of these early uh, on-premises networks. Um, so I get it, right? Like you've invested in this hardware, you've invested in um, the facility, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, moving away from that can be uh, a little disconcerting, especially because you're going from something where, you know, hey, I bought all this stuff five years ago and I thought it was going to last 10 years. Um, and now you're telling me I should move away from it in five. So there's a couple of things. Um, 
that I think go a long way towards making that investment worth it. One is that, you know, you can inherit a certain amount. Now, CMMC hasn't 100% defined how they're going to handle inheritance, but Microsoft will tell you this is how we do things like physically secure. Uh, and this isn't just Microsoft, um, right? We're a Microsoft shop. Other cloud providers will do this too. This is how we physically secure the servers, right? And the data. And so it's not on you to to physically secure everything in the environment. It's not on you um, to make sure that everything is configured uh, correctly down to the hardware. You know, some of those things you're just going to get, you know, sort of for free or at no additional cost by having that um, that be in the in the cloud. Um, the second thing is obviously the mobile access. So, you know, if you're using a fully on-premises network and you have servers and they're in your office and you have people who want to be able to work from home or need to be able to work on travel, they need to connect to those services through your infrastructure, through a VPN. And that VPN is a magnet for adversaries. Um, and you've got to be the one to make sure it's in good shape, right? If you're connecting to the cloud, then everybody's going to connect from wherever they are directly up to the cloud. So you're not funneling all of that traffic through, um, you know, through a device that essentially concentrates it all in one place. And so, um, you know, that makes life easier. If you're doing something like we were talking about earlier with 10% of your workforce being in, in this CMMC environment, you can even have the endpoints in the cloud. So um, if everything is virtual, uh, then you've got a, a, a pretty standard secure environment um, that's easier to you know, confirm is meeting controls and easier to keep meeting controls than having uh, stuff out everywhere. And then you know, we do talk to people on a pretty regular basis that you know they're they're barely keeping that that infrastructure alive, right? It's servers eight, ten years old. They're getting out of compliance. There is going to be a a decent expenditure. You know, it might not have to be this year, but sometime soon. That's going to require all that stuff to be replaced anyway. Um, and so, um, just not having to be the organization that maintains that um, is pretty useful. And then the last thing I'll mention is if you're going to use a third-party provider um, or, you know, if you have people who travel a lot or work from home a lot, um, not needing a person to be in a place to troubleshoot problems is really, really helpful. So there's lots of companies like us that serve customers all over the country. Um, you know, in some cases, you know, in different countries or with employees traveling all over the world. And because what they're using is in the cloud, uh, we can do a whole lot more uh, at a whole lot less cost because we're also connecting to that remotely from wherever we are. Um, you know, and, and I, you know, I helped build a company that did, you know, uh, you know general IT support um, in, the, in the late 90s. And you know, we literally had a geographic radius that we served. If you if your office was this far from our office, we'd charge you extra to drive to your place. Right? Those kinds of things you don't have to deal with if you're you know, if you're in the cloud. Um, now obviously, yes, you've got these remote technologies, you can VPN in, et cetera, but at a certain point sometimes people just need to be able to, you know, to get under the hood and and that, you know, cloud systems are designed to allow you to do that. Microsoft certainly supports that much better. You know, if you've got an on-premises server, then, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, you're, you're going to have to deal with that or have a service provider that'll go deal with your on-premises server. So the, the long-term cost, I think, is, is more advantageous in a cloud environment. Um, it also upgrades a whole lot faster, right? Microsoft upgrades Office 365, you don't. So um, keeping up with with you know the latest technology is a whole lot easier to do when you're in the cloud. Yeah, that was uh, really helpful, and uh, we only have five minutes left, so I do want to transition to the last slide that we have. Um, but I kind of want to talk about a little bit of you know where people are supposed to get these resources from. Do you have any insight on that, Michael? Sure. Um, so, you know, obviously, because we offer it, we, we uh, believe a lot in the managed services model. 
And I think a lot has been made in, you know, on social media uh, and in the press about the overall cost of CMMC. And certainly, if you're going to go try to do all the things that are listed on this slide, if you're going to design your own architecture, if you're going to configure it all, if you're going to run all your logging and monitoring and reporting, if you're going to defend against, um, you know, indicators of compromise, if you're going to provide all your service, if you're going to develop all of your policies, uh, that that could run you a lot of money. Um, to hire these people um, and to go out and and uh, contract with a bunch of different individual consulting firms to do all this or 1099s or whatever that that can run you a lot of a lot of money. Now, if you're a, a large organization, you may already have this staff, and it might be advantageous for you to do this, especially if you've got an investment in uh, an IT infrastructure that's been very customized to your business, right? So you have a CRM that's highly customized, you have a proposal management system that's customized, you got a billing system that's customized, it's all in servers or it's in your data center, et cetera. Um, but if you're a smaller company, um, you don't need a heavily customized technology infrastructure. You can come to a firm like us. Um, you can, um, you know, basically get a set of policies and personnel and um, and uh, um, procedures, you know, on a on an ongoing basis from a company like us to at least do a, a you know a pretty decent chunk of these things. And then as the world changes and you need to change your policies and procedures, you know, the underlying technology gets better, new threats emerge. You know, there's a big crisis, uh, whatever. You know, you've got people on speed dial that can deal with that, and because they're, you know, working to create some sort of economy of scale for all this, they they can make these sorts of services affordable for for your uh, your organization. Um, and so, you know, you got to make sure that they know what they're talking about. You want to look for an understanding of and a presentation of a shared responsibility matrix so everybody knows who's supposed to do what with each control. Um, you know, you want to make sure that the infrastructure that they're recommending you use, uh, that those providers have at least, you know, made some of their own statements about how those tools are, are compliant with government requirements. Uh, but you can offload a lot of this. Uh, and so while I understand and respect the debate that's out in the market about the cost of CMMC, you know, it's also incumbent upon industry, you know, for us to develop solutions that are cost effective for, you know, for smaller DIB companies. All right. We're a little short on time. I'm just going to wrap up now. And if we did not get to your question, um, we will reach out uh, individually and make sure that we answer your question. So thank you everybody for the participation. We really enjoyed, um, you know, having a conversation with you and um, getting you involved. This was a lot of fun. Um, hopefully you learned something today. Um, and through these five steps, you know, you're, you're headed in the right direction of what to do next. Um, so yeah, if you have any other questions, just feel free to reach out, um, and we'll make sure you have all of our information, but it was, um, it was a pleasure to be here today, uh, and I appreciate all of your all's time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Bethany. Thanks, Carly. Yeah, thank you. This was fun. Bye. Bye.